Thank you so much. Thanks for the hospitality, the opportunity. Um, I was just thinking it's moving for someone of my particular generation also to speak about democracy in Prague because the events here uh, were so formative for, for us. I was here also early in, the, in the 1990s um, and been, have been back since, but it's always moving to be here. Um, yeah, so I, I want to uh, try to shake your confidence in a metaphor, the idea of people as points in space, which I think is, um, has us all in its grip, this metaphor. And as a metaphor, it's not exactly false, because metaphors aren't true or false, but it's, um, it's imprisoning us a little bit. And I want to give you an alternative uh, way of thinking about people and um, their interactions. So uh, the dominant model, I think, is this one of, of people as points in space. And it comes out in all kinds of ordinary language in English, but I suspect this, this translates. So we talk about people as having a, a position on an issue. It's a point in space. Uh, they have a perspective. That's what you see from a point in space. Um, we talk about the political spectrum, uh, and that is a, the same metaphor. It's a spatial metaphor. You're positioned somewhere between left and right on the political spectrum. Um, polarization is the metaphor is, is driving that idea because to say that a population is polarizing is to say that their points are moving apart. Um, even a viewpoint is very much like a perspective. It's a place from which you see the world. And again, I don't think this is false. In fact, I think there are insights to be derived from this metaphor, but I think we're sort of stuck in it. Uh, one place that this metaphor is dominant is in sort of the empirical study of people's of politics, um, based often on, on surveys. So every day, articles are published which use this metaphor, and it's very easy to find a local example. So in about five minutes, I found a Czech example. It's a very good article, I'm not critical, but it's, uh, this article is positioning all Czech voters on two uh, continua, um, left or right, and also how old they are, um, and is, is using that to position the political parties from a couple of years ago. Um, and so metaphorically, each individual is seen as occupying a point on two-dimensional space here, but you can have more than two dimensions. Strangely enough, a similar way of thinking is also evident in a very different cultural, a different part of, of academic or intellectual life, which is high continental philosophy, starting with, with Hegel and Herder in the 18th, late 18th century, early 19th century, and coming down to contemporary thinkers, where very often the idea is that there isn't simply a world, there's a world as perceived from perspective, but now often the perspective is one of a culture or a social class for Marx. Um, and so this, this idea, this very general idea is captured, for example, strongly, but I think not unusually, by Nietzsche when he says, the dangerous old conceptual fables always demand that we should think of an eye that one cannot imagine, an eye turned in no direction, but there's only perspective seeing, only a perspective knowing. So everybody is seeing from a place. So there's this funny kind of similarity between these two um, very different worlds, uh, united by a similar metaphor. So the metaphor has value. You can learn about, for example, the Czech electorate using it, but I think it has some significant disadvantages. It conceals the complexity and the inner logic of each person's ideas. So you don't just have a position, you have a complex set of ideas that fit together in a certain way, and that's lost if you try to position people. Likewise, if two people appear to be apart from each other, in a point metaphor, the assumption is that they don't agree about anything, but in reality we think many things, each of us, and it's quite possible that two people who are positioned differently actually agree about a great deal. It, it tends to link what people think to who they are, because as me, as this uh, middle-aged white American from the Northeast, I see things a certain way. So then my, what I think and what I believe gets connected to who I am, which means also that potentially challenges to what another person thinks are understood as challenges to their very identity, which raises the temperature when we try to discuss in a way that can be harmful. And in fact, more generally, it often will suggest that something like deliberation, talking about what we should do together is virtually impossible because we occupy different points in space. And last bullet point, it, I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate in a slide or two. It tends to 
This model tends to generate discouraging results about the possibility of democracy. It tends to suggest we can't sort of have a democracy. Particularly in, in the huge literature on the US electorate, thousands and thousands of books, I, I think I can discern two troubling traditions um, that, that are basically yield warnings about how we can't really have a democracy that are reliant on this metaphor of points in space. So one long tradition goes, the authoritarian personality is a classic book from the 1950s, going down to recent books, says we can explain where people stand, their opinion on issues based on something about the person that we can discern through psychological research that the person is unconscious of. These are implicit biases or implicit uh, foundations of their thinking. And that's doubly troubling, one, because it means that we're not very good at thinking, really, because we're driven by unconscious factors that we don't even recognize. And two, some of the factors are bad. So the authoritarian personality said that a bunch of Americans were authoritarians and that that was driving, in fact, fascists. The, it's the F scale, stands for fascists, and that was driving their opinions about ordinary issues. Um, so we're unable to even know why we think what we do, but often what, the reason is bad. Or the other tradition, which goes back to, um, that's Philip Converse up at the top in the 1960s, founder of political science uh, survey research in the US, and going down to recent books, says actually um, people, most people don't have meaningful opinions at all. That when you look closely, their opinions are scattered, random, um, driven by the latest thing that political elites are saying, incoherent, um, and uh, also unstable, so they change their minds all the time. And so in the, the left column, you get people are implicitly something that we can name, like fascists. And on the right, you get people are basically not very smart. Um, either way, we're not in very good shape for democracy. And either way, specifically, we can, um, we can so what about all that talk, though? Uh, every day you see people talking about politics in high, uh, beautiful rooms like this um, in serious ways and also just chatting. And if, if either of these two, um, sorry, if, I should go back. Um, if either of these two theories are correct, then all that chat is pointless, right? It's, it's nothing but um, rationalizations. And a rationalization is a kind of explanation you give to justify what you've said. It doesn't actually explain why you've said it. It just justifies it. And so all that conversation is um, just rationalization. Although that's a, that's a thesis about uh, the way the world works that's being importantly challenged, and I particularly recommend because I'm recently converted to it, the work of uh, Mercier and Sperber, um, who argue that in fact, we do reason. We do reason and we reason importantly. Um, so uh, all the results that I've, I've uh, shown so far tend to undermine our uh, support for the possibility of democracy. And I think that at the level of intellectual life and academic life, um, our, the sort of support for an enthusiasm for democracy is actually at a low ebb, uh, a low ebb for my life and maybe for the last century where um, academics give really grudging support for the possibility of a democracy. Um, and, and that itself undermines our enthusiasm for the project of democracy. So I wanna challenge it. So the first point is um, people actually do give reasons for what they think, and it's, that's obvious. You know that from just talking to other people, but in a, just an example of a study, we ask people why they think uh, taxes should be raised or lowered, and all the people give reasons. This, per, this individual, particular randomly selected individual says taxes should be raised on high incomes. Why? Because $250,000 is plenty of money, and paying a few extra dollars won't hurt the person. So the, the individual is connecting a conclusion to several reasons, and everybody does this. Um, according to Mercier and Sperber and some others, um, reasons of that type matter at the group level. It's not so much that the individual is thinking all that brilliantly, but when we exchange reasons with each other, the reasons can actually persuade. We can, we can evaluate reasons other people give us, and we can um, change our minds based on the reasons that we're given. So here's the alternative model. Um, I, I'm trying to coin a word for it, which an idiodictuon would be the Greek word for, a, a, for an individual network, but we could just call it a belief network. And in this model, a person's not a point in space, 
a person has in their mind a lot of ideas, a lot of separate ideas. Those are going to be the dots or nodes on my maps. And they also connect them, and they can connect them explicitly. They can say, I believe this because I believe that. And so the, the uh, quick illustration here is deriving from text that an individual gave us. She ty or they typed a lot of text. And we derive a, uh, a view of the topic of abortion from this individual's writing, which involved a lot of points and a lot of connections that the person drew. And so the, I'm going to show you a lot of diagrams in about five to 10 minutes a lot of diagrams of people's belief networks, or idiodictuons, and they are always either derived from uh, interviewing the people, reading what the people have said, or sometimes surveying them with a survey that asks them to connect their ideas. So you're gonna see a lot of these diagrams. So the basic model is that people have diagrams in their head, or we can represent their thinking with diagrams, uh, which are networks. And so, the, and so you couldn't really put that as a point on, in space because it's an, instead it's a network. So individuals have um, linked beliefs about political or moral issues. Here are two students, they're, those are pseudonyms, but they're two students, both of whom discussed the question of um, why health is so unequal in the United States based on race and class and other, why, why we have very terribly different uh, health outcomes for different populations. And each of them talked about that and they produce different, they sort of uh, indicate that they hold different models of the issue. Working with ideas like, which they generated themselves, like class or opportunity or health, but putting them together in different ways. Um, in doing that, if you glean idea networks from individuals, they can be very complex. Uh, this is just actually part of the diagram of the belief network of an individual extracted from uh, survey data where he's putting together all kinds of ideas here I'm highlighting certain ideas having to do with race and racial equity in the United States. But an individual's uh, belief network can be quite complicated. They're heterogeneous. So here I'm showing the belief networks for two individuals. I'm choosing them because the two individuals seem so similar. They're actually two men of almost exactly the same age. I think they were the same age in, in the sample. They both said that their favorite American politician was Senator Bernie Sanders, so social Democrat. So they're kind of lefty American men of the, same, of the same background. And they believe in a lot of the same things. The dots are ideas that they actually asserted. So they both believe in less corporate influence in government. They both believe in free college for everyone. But there's some important differences which would be lost, I think, unless you model their thinking in this way. In particular, different uh, ideas play much more important roles in their logic. So the person on the right has got, is really, for him, uh, an outcome in the world, a social change, which is free health insurance for everyone, is playing an important role in his thinking. For the person on the left, a less corrupt government is. And I think further investigation of these two people would show that the person on the left is really a political reform person who thinks that that's the central goal, and the person on the right is a social equity person. And they end up voting for the same candidate, but they have a different logic. Um, now, all of those maps would be merely interesting, maybe not even very interesting, if they didn't uh, predict anything in the real world. And I think one should be skeptical that somebody like me is deriving these network models from people's thinking, but they don't do anything in the world. But I've been finding that you can predict people's opinions about issues. If you, if you separately ask them, what do you think about an issue, you can predict it based on the structure of their thinking. For example, in a sample of people, if they think that the idea of reforming the US prison system is central, that's not whether they endorse it or not, but if it's central to their thinking, um, if free college is central to their thinking, but if an environmental reform is less central, um, then they're more likely to support Bernie Sanders. So that's in fact a way to predict whether they will support that candidate um, among a range of other candidates. And so this is just the tip of an iceberg of research, but the conclusion is that if you know something about the way people organize their own thinking, you know about their behavior in a way that you wouldn't know otherwise. Um, I suspect after you know, 57 years of life and, look, and looking at the people around me, that individuals tend to think about many issues in a similar structural way. So you encounter people who organize everything. 
who have very centralized, organized systems for thinking about everything. You encounter people who have scattered ideas and they don't connect, um, and so on. And there are other kind of, I think, signature ways of thinking about issues that are personality traits, so they carry across different topics. I haven't shown that at all in my own research, but Sarah Sugars wrote a dissertation a couple of years ago, and, and Sugars has some evidence that the same people will generate the same kind of networks on different issues. So next piece of the model, and I don't have too much more to present, but next piece of the model, when we discuss what we're doing, I'm going to ask you to think of it metaphorically like this, is we are sharing nodes or links from our own networks with other people so that they might take our ideas into their networks. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm giving you ideas, and I'm hoping that you will be able to take some of the ideas into the network. So Adele said this in a pre-discussion um, exercise. She, she typed some words about health, and we derived this network from her. These were her. In other words, these were her private thoughts. But then she went into a class discussion with her fellow students at, at Kansas State University in the middle of you know, the American heartland. Uh, and the diagram on the right diagrams their conversation. It zooms out and it diagrams their conversation and as a whole class. And they end up talking about the links and connections among such issues as social class, race and ethnicity, the way people are brought up in their households and the opportunities that they have in society and how those connect to health. Health isn't shown in the right because they were all talking about health all the time. So she is contributing ideas to a class discussion that looks like the discussion on the right. Um, you might be thinking that I'm thinking that we all have some kind of elaborate mental model in our heads that's sort of there. And when we come into a conversation, we're, we know what it is and we're ready to disclose it. But I don't think that at all. I think that as we discuss we are finding out what our own networks are. There's a co-creation involved. In a conversation, I'm saying things, because I think I believe them, so they're coming out of me, but I didn't necessarily think them until we talked. And to some extent, I'm thinking them because of who you are, what I think you're interested in, what I think you might say. So this is a piece of representation of a person's mental map that I derived by interviewing the person. The reason I'm showing it to you is I think I influenced the nature of that map. I think it's a map of the person's thinking, but I think that the fact the person was talking to me probably influences the map. So methodologically, this is a bit of a challenge because it means how do we know what's really in the person's head? But that's the wrong way to think about it. It's not that things are just in our heads. We're very, very social, very interactive primates, and we're co-constructing networks as we talk. And while that's hard to study, it's actually beautiful as a fact about human beings that we're interactive in that way. So I, I actually love this diagram because it shows something that was crea created in the conversation, but I don't think that we are walking around with a fixed network in our head. Um, now, next point is I think some of us have networks of ideas in our heads which are better or worse for discussion. You've already seen the person on the left, that's their view of, um, of um, abortion, yeah, of the abortion issue. And the, uh, it's compared to another person's actual view that we captured. The difference here I want to point to is the difference of, of um, geometry or structure. The person on the left has a lot of ideas and a lot of connections, um, which means that in conversing with the person on the left, you could, you could talk about a lot of different things with that person. You could enter the conversation in a lot of different places. And if you found you disagreed with a certain point, you could find another way around and continue the conversation. So that person could be interactive. The person on the right, the way we diagram them, ends up in this closed circle so that really there's no other way around but to hold the beliefs that that person has. And this is the familiar kind of person who's quite ideological in one use of the word ideology. And you can't talk to them because they always come back to the same thing. Um, so in fact, one of the two students that I showed earlier, Beth, she has a super simple mental model of the issue of health. And really, it all comes down to the idea that it's up to individuals to exercise effort in taking care of their own health. That's the only arrow she has going to health. And so I would predict that she's not gonna be that easy to talk to because she only has one model, one, one explanation. And in fact, in the conversation that ensued, she was perfectly nice and polite and said nice things to everybody else, but all she ever said in the conversation three or four times was, it's about effort. Whereas her, her colleague 
fellow student who had a more complicated model was actually more interactive with the other people. Um, we're getting to larger scales as we also come to, towards the conclusion of my talk. Um, what causes a idea f go to my, from my head into yours? I think three things. First of all, we, I have to have some ability to reach you, so I have to be central in some kind of a social network. So the fact that I've been kindly given a podium to talk to you today gives me the advantage that you have to listen to me. So um, people who have a podium get heard more. So um, a standard kind of social network analysis will suggest that people who have more connections are more likely to spread their ideas. The second thing is uh, I have to do a good job persuading you. So um, I'm gonna have to be trusted. Uh, I'm gonna have to also just be clear. So there are things about me and the way you perceive me that matter. So the first point is who, what I'm doing in the society. The second point is how am I behaving and how are you perceiving me? But the third point, which is a little more original, is my idea has gotta be able to fit in your existing network. Because when you take my belief, which is a node, a point, in, a point in the network, and you put it in your network, it's gonna have to find a place. And if it doesn't find a place and it messes up your network a lot, you're gonna be much more resistant to taking it on. So I think we can understand how ideas spread using this model. Uh, I, I haven't, this is a parenthesis because it's a bigger discussion, but I happen to think it's reasonable for you to assess whether to take a belief from me based in part on how you have assessed me. In other words, I do think that personal assessment, assessment of the individual and their reliability is a reasonable thing for people to do. And that's, that's somewhat debatable because there's a sort of pure model of science in which it shouldn't matter who, who I am. But I think we're social primates and we have to assess the reliability of the people who are talking to us. All right, so if an individual can have a belief network, so can a group if they've interacted to form a belief network. So this is the discussion of um, health in two university campuses now simultaneously and separately. In my university, which is, would be generally considered very liberal in the American context, and at Kansas State University, which would generally be considered, considered much more conservative. They talked about the same thing. The two models show the differences. The, the difference I want to point out is that for um, the Tufts students on the left, there was very little discussion about how the values that you are given in your family might affect health. Whereas for the Kansas State students, that was very much top of mind. So the, up, the upbringing button, upbringing dot, is much more important in the logic of the Kansas State students. And that's consistent with saying that the students on the left were further left. Because in, at least in the American context, if you talk a lot about the way parents bring up children, you're likely to tilt more conservative. And if you talk instead about the influence of race and class and opportunity, you're more likely to be liberal. So these are valid kind of, I mean, they're, they, they're, they have what we call face validity. They look like plausible ex descriptions of a liberal and a conservative conversation. But it's a much more nuanced and complicated way of thinking about um, the difference because the usual way would again be in terms of points in space. Uh, Massachusetts is left of Kansas, Kansas is right of, Massachusetts, but that ignores the um, complexity and the similarity. They actually have a lot of things in common. The, the difference here is meaningful, and it's a difference that we talk about in terms of conservative versus liberal, but it's a difference in, the way, in what they think of as a cause, as a causal factor. And we have to, in order to see that, we have to map their, um, their, uh, their networks a little more carefully. When an idea does spread, from one person's network into many people's networks, and it becomes indeed the common idea, you have a new thing, a norm. So, you know, the idea of same-sex marriage or marriage equality actually can be traced back about 100 years into, our, into history, but it was a very unusual idea early in my lifetime. It spreads, for reasons that I think we can explain, to become norm in country after country, so 2017, Australia, and I understand the issues unsettled in the Czech Republic, get legally unsettled, but I think the norm is amazingly uh, spreading. Um, all right, last couple points. What, do we th what happens when we start to look at, at difference and interaction? So uh, several years ago, I talked to 20 people who were basically friends of mine, uh, un unscientific sample. 
and each of us kind of maps out the belief networks of the, that individual. And then we deliberately put all their belief networks together on a single uh, representation. And when anybody had the same idea, when any, when any two people had, had expressed the same idea, we, we treated it as if they had endorsed the same dot, the same node. And what I'm showing you here is a, um, a piece of one person's network, and it happens to be a, someone who is religious. You can tell because the, one of the dots over there on the left is God is love, and this is somebody who's quite religious. But another person, in, at least one other people in this group of 20, was quite an atheist for whom religion is the root of all evil. So they have um, different beliefs. However, it turns out that these two people have a lot of um, overlap, and it, particularly they, they, they turned out to have a lot of overlap around the idea that humility, humbleness, is a virtue. And in fact, um, when we put the, all the networks together, and here I'm getting rid of the names because it's too hard to read, and I'm just zooming back, but we put all the ideas together, they actually all connected. Now, this is not a representation of agreement because one person said, you know, religion is foolish and another person said God is love. They disagreed. But you could trace uh, a set of agreements through the heads of the different people in the room from one person's head into another. And actually, it turns out that every single idea uh, would connect to every single idea through a set of, through a chain, which, however, not everyone would follow the chain all the way. So this is a different way of thinking about a group that re reflects disagreements as well as connection. And I don't know what would happen if you mapped seven billion human beings on the Earth, but I think it's possible that you would have no separate archipelagos or islands, because it's quite possible that by the time you look at all the things that all the different people believe and you look at all the connections that could be through multiple people's heads, that we would find it was like this, one big um, network of disagreement and agreement, um, something that I've been trying to argue in different kinds of ways all the way back since the 1990s. So we're all connected, even though we're all different. Last slide, what are the implications of thinking this way? First of all, I think that when you think this way, you can get a more optimistic, but reasonably optimistic, view of abil people's ability to participate in democracy. That, that picture uh, here is, a, I think, a ins relatively inspiring picture compared to the other pictures we give. Um, secondly, uh, it actually is a good idea to map your own ideas, your own belief networks. You can learn not only what you believe, but also how you organize your beliefs, and you can assess that critically and say to yourself, for example, my belief network is so centralized that nobody can talk to me. There's no way for them to connect if they don't agree, and then you can try to change that, which is a, also a path to education. Um, when we look at group dynamics, conversations, we might be able to both evaluate and improve the discussions by looking at how they how, they, how the people's uh, beliefs connect to other people's beliefs in the room. Um, large groups might be able to intentionally develop shared network models to guide their, um, their action going forward. This actually, so I've done some of this work with groups for practical reasons, trying to actually figure out a shared model that they can act on. And this actually, I think, also connects to the, to the Institute, to Institute H21's work on voting because there, there may be some ways to think about um, aggregating opinions that are uh, unique. Um, and I think we can just simply understand more about why people believe the things they believe and um, why they change what they believe if we model them this way. So that's my, that's actually my talk, my, my uh, presentation, and I hope it contributes to today's conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for the presentation. We have some time for questions. I was hoping we did. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand, yeah. and either me or my colleague will give you the microphone. Okay. Thank you, Professor, for your fascinating presentation. I have a question. In the 50s, or even in the 80s of the 20th century, Americans watched the same TVs, shared the same paradigms of conversations. The country used to be less polarized than today. Now we are social networks. We are more interconnected than ever before. And American society is more polarized than perhaps in the 60s or before the Civil War. Why is it so? Is it a result of the fact that we do not 
have conversations with other thinking people, but only stay in our ideological bubbles? Right, so that's a great question, and of course there's a huge discussion about it. I mean, one possibility is that we know or we can see better that America is uh, polarized because um, it's more evident, right? So it used to be that you couldn't tell that from watching the television because there were only three networks and they said the same thing, but that in people's private houses they were actually extremely polarized, they just weren't. Um, another possibility is that we are more polarized and it's because we can choose our news and, uh, and information uh, and we have so much choice. Um, you know, there's also funny paradoxes because we, we're polarized in, that's, that's a word, but um, we're divided between two political parties and we don't like each other. So the um, measures of how much you like the other party are, are very much worse than they used to be. But you could also say, certainly from a European perspective, that our, our policy debate is actually very narrow. So it's, com so it's com complicated. I mean, it's complicated and I don't have definitive answers. The one thing, the one thing I would ask us to do though is not necessarily jump to the metaphor of polarization because that, metaf that metaphor already tells us that for example, the students in Kansas and the students in Tufts that I measured are some distant and perhaps further apart than they used to be. But I would just draw to your attention that they actually had very many of the same ideas in mind. They structured them differently and one idea played an influential role in one conversation that didn't play an influential role in the other conversation. And that's a different way of thinking about polarization. It, it has the practical implication that at Tufts, my university, we probably should ask those students about the idea that's influential in Kansas. So we should connect the two conversations by saying, hey, you know, there are these other students who think this and bring in, and, but that's not the same thing as saying, you all need to move further right because you're too far left because you're polarized. That's, that's the polarization model. Thank you for fantastic talk. Franciszek Kalovas, University of West Bohemia. Uh, I'd like to follow up the, yeah. the question. Uh, can you see, because we are still afraid, we are polarized, uh, this is problem, society is disrupted, breaking up. Can you see something positive on this uh, polarization and this polarization process? And could you share it with us? Yeah, well, let me say something. Yes, let me say something but I think it's quite important, but you may not agree with it, but I'll say it anyway. We, we, um, the conversations we have occur in civil society. They occur in associations, organizations, media that we build as human beings. And they do go better or worse depending on whether we build them better or worse. My claim is that right now there's a very profound pessimism in intellectual life that basically says people are stupid and they hate each other. And this is, um, this is supposed to be a scientific finding based on a bunch of different kinds of uh, thinking. And therefore, you're not gonna be able to build good systems. And so the best we can do, is sometimes said, is to sort of safeguard our systems against collapse. Um, and that spirit is a spirit that frustrates innovation and creativity. So in, in ninth, so I'll say this briefly as I can. In 1900 in the United States, if you had said, I would like to start having high quality newspapers and sell them to a large public, and they will talk about the whole world, and they will do so in a nonpartisan way, everybody would have laughed at you because uh, they would have looked at the actual media of the late 19th century, and they had said, no, people aren't, are, they're, they're stupid, and they hate each other. So they're, they're, they're in ideological bubbles, and they're not very thoughtful. They're not gonna pay for news. But people built pretty good newspapers in the 20th century. They're in trouble now for economic reasons. They built them because they had a kind of um, optimism that people's, psychologies were somewhat malleable and dependent on how, what they were offered and how they were taught. And so I think we're at a low ebb of confidence that we could build better social institutions. I mean, thinking about this in terms of Prague between the first time I came here and now, where you know, that was a moment of, the, 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 the late 80s, 90s was a moment of we can build a new civil society. And it was inspired, your model, if you're Czech, was inspiring to me. Now we have very little sense of that inspiration, and I'm trying to shake some of the intellectual paradigms that I think are just telling us that the inability to do it better is hardwired. And I think that's, that's partly reading off poor, it's, it's using data from poor institutions at the moment to infer something permanent, which is self-reinforcing uh, pessimism that we need to get out of. 
Professor, thank you, Andrzej Dostal. I wanted to ask, uh, what do you think about the phenomenon that sometimes uh, people have uh, topics which are highly relevant for them, but they hate to speak about them, especially mm -hmm. if they are poor. And uh, there are other topics which people love to speak about, uh, but uh, they are not very much relevant for their political decision making. An example from uh, here, uh, many people weren't able to uh, afford uh, a proper car repair or beer is too expensive or a summer camp for children is too expensive, but they would never speak about this on social networks because it's a shame. Uh, yeah. On the other hand, everybody is speaking about same-sex marriage, uh, but I don't think it is highly relevant for them, perhaps is. Uh, what do you think about this and forming political opinions? Thank you. Thank you. Great question. I, I mean, I would make a, a, a pitch for pluralism. There should be, in any rich, complex society, there should be multiple spaces for conversation. Um, that maybe sounds obvious, but there is a tendency to um, both centralize the conversation and also to assume that there should be one conversation. So some of the um, empirical research that I showed briefly has underneath it the assumption that there should be this American conversation. And actually, the voter should be informed about what's, an import what's important. And if you find that people don't have opinions about the issues that the elites think are important, that shows that those people are ignorant. And then we need to educate them. And I actually have a much more tolerant view because I think life is complicated. People's own lives are relevant and diverse. And the, 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 the agenda that's being set by some kind of political elite is not necessarily the agenda that everybody should follow. So it may be that same sex, you know, I don't know the politics, but it may be that that's coming from political elites because of an international conversation. And actually a lot of Czech people just don't even really care. And I would just be tolerant of that. So I would reject the notion that there's sort of this list of issues and that there's a deficit in the uh, population if they are not engaging with those issues. I would start with the things that all the people care about and imagine that there ought to be, that they won't all care about the same things because their lives are different and so there ought to be multiple conversations. So thank you, thank you very much for a nice interesting talk which at the beginning, I understood you as a radical. So somebody who want to depart from the classical physical paradigm, putting people as points into space and starting, so giving away the externalization of us. So we are not there, we are somehow internal. But then as it went on, I understood that you are not so very radical. You just want to replace the mechanics by thermodynamics. So instead of a body, we are a gas, so we are many points moving in space, but still it's physical metaphor, still it's externalizing. So in a sense, uh, what do you think about the radical move of really getting rid of uh, these physical models in explanation of human behavior? Yeah, I, I have to think about that more, it's so interesting. I mean, of course, my instinct is to say, well, whichever one uh, is persuasive to you, like if you, if you, I, I, I believe the things I put on the slides, if, if you wanna see those as deeply radical, then great, because you'll agree with me. And on the other hand, if you're a little cautious, then think of it as a tweak and that's good too, I don't care. But th that's a bad answer. I, sh I should think about it a little more. I do think you could, you could uh, if you wanna be a little grandiose, you could think of, you could ask why is it that both continental philosophy and empirical social science have the same idea? And you could call that mo modernity. That, that there are things about modernity, including the anonymity of interactions at large scale, the fact that people are put together in a big European city and they don't know each other, that promotes a sense of all the other people as being points in space, which would influence not only social scientists, but also Friedrich Nietzsche and, oh, and Heidegger and lots of people. And then this would be uh, an attempt to rehumanize out of that. And if certainly not original to me, I think a lot of the later 20th century and 21st century has been attempt to be postmodern in this in this kind of way so that would be another way to think about it okay we have time for one more question so. thank you so much for your impactful insights i would like to ask you how do you actually prevent a confirmation bias because people have a tendency to search and look up information based on their belief that they already adapted and it's really mm -hmm. difficult to kind of escape this um, phenomena or vicious cycle almost thank you Yes, yeah, so I think that what I, what I take away from, um, partly from Mercier and Sperber is, uh, let's think about this in, as a problem besetting very social primates who are 
pretty naturally equipped to do some things and not very good at doing other things. So we're not gonna be able to escape from confirmation bias very well by going into our own heads privately and thinking everything through. Because actually we're not very good at that. And we, we're very, um, not very self-conscious about how bad we are at it. So our biases are much stronger than we think and we can't shake them. But what we can do pretty well is interact with other primates, well, well other human beings, to the main point. And we can ask which ones we should interact with. And so one thing you need to do is interact with people who disagree with you. And you can tell whether they disagree with you. And you can tell also whether they disagree with you in ways that are helpful. I mean, is the person just a jerk and I don't need to talk to them or is the person challenging me? So I think I would be very um, social emotional about it. It's, it's so, and not that intellectual. So, so to check confirmation bias is to develop trust for people human be real individual human beings who don't agree with you. And that's something that we're capable of doing. Thank you. Okay, well, I think that's a beautiful uh, note to end on. Thank you very much again, Professor Levine. Thank you, thanks for the question.